the original organization went bankrupt a week into the march and stranded us in the Mojave Desert. And, and there were 45 mile an hour winds and it was and it was 45 degrees and it was pouring rain and we were in this mud hole in the uh, in the Mojave Desert. And the organizer of the of the march flew in in a helicopter and said, "It's all over. Everybody go home," and and flew away. And and, um, and a lot of people did leave. We started out with about 1,200, but there were about 300 of us that that stayed, just because partly because a core group in the organization had seen this coming, and they formed another um, kind of secretly formed another nonprofit organization in case this happened. And they felt if we could just hang out in the mud hole for a few weeks, um, that they might be able to get enough donations for us to continue. And um, mm -hmm. so while we were stuck in the mud hole, um, one of the first things that happened was in the exodus of most of the people leaving, somebody stole my sleeping bag. And I was still in this high, this, uh, this, this very high place. and. Um, uh, I guess I turned 29 years old by then, and uh, I became known as the guy who didn't have a sleeping bag but wasn't worried about it. And, uh, and every every night I would walk around the camp as it was starting to get dark, and I'd say, "Anybody have an extra sleeping bag?" And uh, or I'd go to the Lost and Found and see if one was was there, or if somebody had a roommate who'd gone into town because we didn't have showers or anything. So sometimes somebody would go into town and stay at a hotel for the evening. Um, and I was completely unconcerned. I always got a sleeping bag. One night I didn't. I just put on all my clothes and slept on the floor of the tent. I really was, nothing, nothing was bothering me. It's like that wisdom piece that, that, um, that, that um, David Lloyd was talking about yesterday. Nothing mattered, nothing mattered really. You know, I mean something mattered because I was on the Great Peace March. And I was very concerned about the issue, but as far as moment to moment, I wasn't worried about anything happening. And then this, this um, young woman uh, who was a friend, already a friend from the march, she really took a shine to me. And be, I think because I was just calm in the middle of all this. I mean, it was chaos. We had like charismatic leaders would, would rise up one day and stand on a picnic table and, and say, we're going across the desert now. We don't need supplies. We can make it. You know, God is behind us. And then that person, nobody would follow him, and that person would disappear. <laughs> and it was like, I, I just thought, I'm not going anywhere. This is the most fascinating thing I've ever seen, right? <laughs> and and um, it was like the collapse of a small country. Um, and um, anyway, um, and it was still very cold and very wet. And uh, a lot of us would all pile into one tent at night, like in a puppy pile, and um, to, to stay warm. And, um, and, one, and this particular night, we were in this big puppy pile, and everybody fell asleep, except for me and this, this woman who'd kind of latched onto me. And she, she started kissing me. And it was the most peculiar thing, because I kind of knew I didn't want to do it. but. I was 29 years old, and here's a woman I found attractive kissing me. I mean, do you say no? I couldn't say no, right? <laughs> so next thing we knew, I got involved with her. And I was, by the end of a week, I was starting to fall in love. There we were in the mud hole, you know, having this <laughs> glorious relationship in a tent, and, and, and it was very romantic and wonderful. And here's the, the, the most ironic thing. On the march, there was this Englishman who was a Tibetan Buddhist monk. And uh, he, uh, I had my doubts about him, partly because shortly after the march crashed, you know the Durrani we do for the aversion of disaster? Mm -hmm. It's um, the Shosangyo, Kichicho Durrani. How long does it take us to avert disaster by chanting that three times? Mm -hmm. About a couple minutes, maybe a minute. Well, in the Tibetan school, they do five-hour ceremonies to avert disaster. You know, we, we should tell them, you know, that there's a shorter way. And, and my, one, my one connection with this, this Tibetan monk, Englishman, had been that he performed one of these ceremonies, and I got trapped there, and oh my god. It just, if anything ever made me not want to do Buddhism ever again, that, that would have been it. Um, anyway, this woman, uh, who I'll call Jane, who I was getting involved with, um, she, uh, he invited her over to his tent one day to read sacred poetry. 
I guess you know what happened, right? And we had no particular agreement, so I was utterly unconcerned about the fact that something happened between them, too. It's just like, okay, I don't know you, no problem. But she got so confused by the whole thing that she panicked and left the peace march. So, so I got jilted, and, um, and that kind of knocked me off this high. And um, the Peace March was its own kind of high. So for a while, I kind of didn't notice. But I, at the end of the Peace March, I tried to write a book about the experience. And I ended up staying with my best friend on the march. He invited me to stay with us. I utterly failed. I turned 30. And I got a terrible flu that I kind of never got over. I mean, really never got over. I still got it. You know, it's, that's chronic fatigue syndrome. That's how it started. And uh, I went in, I, I turned 30, I thought my life was over, I failed to write this book. And um, I just fell into this terrible depression. And what I realize now is that's, the, that's how the compassion side opens up. You know, you have to. Mm -hmm. I hadn't felt the suffering of the world before, and, and I needed to feel my own suffering and extrapolate it out to realize that, that, um, that just like the Buddha did when he left his home and in the legend saw the sick person, the, the dead person, the old person, etc. It was a bit like that. It's like, oh my God, I was all opened up and I had no idea that, it, that things were like that, you know. Um, but fortunately, my friend's father, in whose house I was living, was a well-known professor of religion and philosophy and he knew Joseph Campbell and Robert Thurman and was friends with people like that and he actually ran a religious studies think tank at Columbia University. Every holy book in, in the world was in his, in his library and so I, I started to go downstairs and read through his library and I knew I had an affinity for Eastern thoughts. So I started with the Eastern stuff. And when I got to Buddhism, it started to make sense. And when I got to Zen, it really started to make sense. And I thought, when I get back to California, I'm going to find myself a Zen teacher. And so um, that's how this journey started. Um, and uh, it's funny, because I was still before the internet. And when I, I flew back to California, a friend of mine picked, up, picked me up in Santa Barbara, where you land on the tarmac. Hmm. And he came, he, it was a really good friend of mine, we'd always discuss philosophy and such. And um, he was so excited to see me, he came running up with this book in his hand, and he said, here, here, you've got to read this. And it was Peter Matheson's Nine-Headed Dragon River. Um, in the last part of the book, he talks about his relationship with Maizumi Roshi, and that Maizumi Roshi is in Los Angeles. And uh, so I thought, this is easy. <laughs> I, just, I just looked up Z in the Los Angeles phone book, and there was Zen Center of Los Angeles, mm -hmm. and uh, started practicing there. So, um, so to get to the Dharma, more to the Dharma part of this, um, um, I think a lot of us have some way in which we're called. And, you know, I had been playing with meditation, but I didn't get really serious until I developed chronic fatigue syndrome. And my health really crumbled. And that's actually the first thing that gave me a handle on it, to put it into remission for a time. Doing, doing sessions, which were so hard for me in the beginning. I know that's that is the way it's been for some of you, and maybe still is for some of you. Uh, probably the first five years of sessions were just, there was at least some point in them where it was just torture, the pain was so bad. And uh, I would also have these giant balls of emotion come up. And, uh, and I couldn't talk to Maizumi Roshi and later Daido Roshi about these. Um, it's not the training that they had. I'm so grateful that we, that we can deal with emotional material here. I knew I had to deal with it because I'd been through some therapy with, uh, with a therapist who was Buddhist and had done a lot of Vipassana practice. And so, 
And so I basically knew that stuff comes up, you got to deal with it. So I just dealt with it privately. Um, but that also taught me something really important, which is, um, which is the practice may look, one of the things that can put people off about Zen sometimes is it looks rigid on the outside. It looks so formal on the outside. Um, on the inside, you can do whatever you want. I can work with my emotions if they came up. And, uh, you know, I was fortunate because that one thing had happened in my practice before I came to formal practice. And so I had a confidence in myself, despite the fact that that felt like it was all gone. It took me years to realize that it wasn't all gone. The fear never came back, you know. Um, but I was in so much pain over the, um, those were my depressive years. and. Uh, I was in so much pain over the world, I just couldn't handle the scales dropping from my eyes like that, you know, um, for a long time, for some years. Um, so, um, to cut to the chase, some years later I went to Naropa Institute to get my MFA in writing, and uh, the, the first summer I was there, uh, John Dado Laurie showed up, Jerry Shishin Wick showed up, Bernie Glassman showed up, uh, Kobin Chino Roshi showed up, Bobby R Barbara Rhodes from the Korean school showed up, um, uh, Jishu Holmes, who was, uh, who was uh, Bernie Glassman's wife, but was a Zen master in her own right, was there. Uh, there was this amazing plethora of, it felt like Zen was just dropping in my lap. And uh, I'd gone to Zen Mountain Monastery and had some brief encounters with, with Dido, and I didn't like him. And I was, I was intimidated by him, and uh, I, I didn't like the whole kind of dragon approach. And uh, when he showed up at Naropa, we had the opportunity to sign up to be somebody's, um, somebody's teaching assistant. I thought, the best thing I can do is sign up to be the teaching assistant to this guy I'm scared of. And uh, which just goes to show that all fear didn't disappear, right? <laughs> you know, just a certain giant chunk of existential fear disappeared. But um, I, I'm forever grateful that I did that because he managed to hold the stern Zen master uh, kind of front for about three days, but he was there for two weeks and it just fell apart. And we started talking and really in two weeks we, we became friends. And uh, I don't think I'd be here today if I hadn't become friends with Dido because, um, because that friendship let me a fairly sensitive soul find my way into what was at that time a harsh looking practice at, at the monastery. People shouted a lot. Um, uh, you were corrected rather fiercely. When you went into to Dokusan, uh, you know, Dida would kind of glare at you and say, do you have anything to say? You know, <laughs> he'd be holding a stick and, and the lights would be low and you could see his sailor tattoos crawling around on his arms and, the, you know, the room was brimming with samadhi and, um, you know, it was, it was set up to intimidate. Um, uh, but once I'd, once I'd gotten to know him, I could kind of get around him, you know, I could kind of say, oh, you know, Dido, we're going to do this. Come on, <laughs> you know, and, I, and it's funny because it's as though I could feel the direction that Zen was, it's much softer at the monastery now, and at the same, at the same time I started practicing with Shishin Roshi, who was coming to Boulder intermittently, and if he'd had a, if he'd had a center there, I probably would have just practiced with him, so, um, but I had like West Coast or East Coast, and I had this strong connection with Dido, so that's where I went first and trained with Dido for 17 years. Um, but um, I always continue to practice with Shishin Roshi too, so th I think the first time I practiced with him was more than 25 years ago back in Europe, I think it was 1991. So. And um, 
My training at the monastery was fantastic as far as, I was very indisciplined, so it gave me discipline. I, um, I probably want to bring this up too because I was desperate, I was very ill. And um, I was only in my 30s and I, you know, some days I couldn't get out of bed. And some of the encouragement I want to give you is oh, probably 50 to 75 percent of you are desperate in some way. <laughs> um, is, uh, I don't know, or were, you know, earlier in one's practice. Um, it's so powerful to harness one's desperation. You know, put your desperation behind the task. I so desperately wanted to learn how to live with with the trouble that I had. And, um, and I did learn to be strong underneath everything that I've done of external value in my life has come since I got sick. All the books I've published, all the teaching I've done, all the stuff I've done. Um, it's all happened since I've been ill. So it taught me to, um, what I learned was not to add identity to illness, mm -hmm. not become the sick person. Mm -hmm. you know? um, that was invaluable. And also not to, that, my, that physical issues are one thing and emotions are another. You, your emotions don't have to go down because you have physical trouble. They tend to, but practice gives you this muscle where you start to not have to go down. You know? um, so, But the other thing I want to, the other reason I want to bring up that emptiness experience is, um, for one thing, the, it's difficult not to see it dualistically, okay? The things of the world are empty, so I'm seeing them empty. And it's not like that in my experience. In my experience, with one kind of set of vision, you understand that things are empty and all connected, but at the same time, they're exactly what they are. It's not like you have to alternate between the kinds of vision. They're, they're the same thing. Things are what they are and they're, and they're empty of individual nature. Not just in the way I described. There's other dimensions and other ways of looking at it, but that's just the way it first appeared to me. Um, and that separation is the, that, that sense of separation that we've developed, that the objects of the world are separate from me. Um, that's our fundamental issue, in, at least as it appears to me. If we, if we didn't feel fundamentally separate, we wouldn't be afraid. We wouldn't be in this kind of pain. We wor wouldn't worry about this individual me when it has to leave this life. Um, The other thing, the reason I wanted to tell this is because when I was at the monastery for 12 years, I was sure something really even bigger and more miraculous was going to happen because I'd had this one thing happen. And here, I, now I was, here I was in Zen, and this is where it happens. And um, it never happens like that. You can't seek an experience in that way, in that grabby way. Um, you kind of can't help that your mind's going to do that. But anything we can conceive of or think we're grasping for isn't the thing. It just, it's prior to thought, it's prior to the conscious mind. It actually wasn't until I um, started practicing again, there was kind of a gap there where I didn't practice very much with, uh, with the Sangha, but uh, around 2001, I, um, I started practicing a lot with Shishin Roshi again, and just this, I could relax in these, in these sessions in a way that I couldn't at the monastery with people, you know, yelling and walking with a stick, shouting, wake up, you know, not even like that, wait, you want to hear how it really was? Yeah. Okay, yeah. you ready? Yeah. Wake up! <laughs> <laughs> Followed by a quick break. Yeah. Stop moving! <laughs> you know, like that. And, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a gentle soul. I'm a sensitive soul. It was a little too much for me. I learned a lot from it, but 
all of a sudden my practice started to open up again, you know, to which I'm forever grateful. And um, the thing that I'm grateful for my time practicing with Daido too, but what Shishin Roshi and Shinko Roshi both have is one of the things I learned from my whole training experience, my whole practice, I've been practicing now my whole adult life, really. And I'm um, 62 now, formally practicing for more than 30 years. It's my conviction that everybody has their own blueprint for awakening, their own blueprint for liberation within them. And, and uh, Shishin Roshi and Shinko Roshi, uh, have the, they have an ability to meet the needs of the student and not just run them through a form and a system. Mm -hmm. And um, I can't tell you how, how patient Shishin Roshi was with me because I had a koan phobia. And, <laughs> and uh, he was just very skillful with helping me get through that system. And, uh, so I encourage, uh, uh, for practice to work, and in doing my book, One Bird, One Stone, I talked to a hundred different senior students and teachers all over the country and um, interviewed them. And I found that the people I felt who were most, who'd grown the most in their practice were the ones who'd found a clear space within the practice to be creative, to find their own creative way through. If it's not a process of inquiry, that's, that's driven by our own desire to, to know, then, then, then it's going to be limited. I meet people who are still doing the same practice they did 25 years ago and it's just gone dead because they never, they never realized that on the inside of practice you need to find your own way and you need to make it your own. So.